This is the Go Maluku podcast. Um, there's there's so many indigenous peoples out there that um, yeah, they're doing amazing work um, that have um, yeah uh, um, have overcome challenges actually to to really to be where they are uh, to do to do what they do and and yeah most of the people that I talk to um, in these conversations is like they had a lot of hardships that they had to overcome um, it is um, yeah and. A lot of aha moments as well like ah yeah that, that's um and then the what i what is also interesting is that it doesn't matter how old or young they are um the they like to send the elevator down um as in all right um there's if there's any indigenous youth or new indigenous peoples representatives out there that want to do something similar or trying to seek inspiration um this and you want to do i don't know uh, to speak up for you indigenous peoples then this might want is something that you want to think about um so in a way it it's i'm recording all these conversations and it is not a i have a list of questions and i'm not trying to like go through it like like a wish list um it, it it's not like that it's most I find value in, in, no, no, so sorry, I should, should say differently. There's value in the stories that people share. And the people that are listening or watching, they always find the, these tiny nuggets of information that can be very, very helpful. And so when you do all these conversations and then people can pick up, um, this is from, so I had a journalist from uh, from um, uh, Northern Scandinavia, from the Sami Indigenous peoples, the other day. Um, yesterday, I had a um, the Indigenous rights researcher for um, Amnesty International um, you know, on, on the podcast as well, and he, he shared, "All right, this, this is what the, he, this is what Amnesty International is looking to, or like, and this is what their concerns are." and um, the question was also, how can in Amnesty International better help indigenous peoples? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is, um, yeah, it, it is, it is, so I'm doing this podcast mostly out of personal frustration, oh, as, as in, yeah. as in, as in, as in, um, I want to learn more. more like motivational from the inside. Yes, um, yeah, uh, definitely. And because there's so many in, indigenous peoples out there, and I do not claim to know everyone. Uh, but I definitely would like to learn about um, yeah, the, 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 the plights and the journeys and everything else. And while whilst I am learning, um, I thought, why not record it? And then others can learn as well. Um, so and I think that's why I um, yeah, to um, um, stumbled upon your LinkedIn profile. I like, oh, wow, this is um, there's so many inspiring indigenous peoples out there um, that um, yeah, there, there, there's small circles. There's, um, I mainly work in the international indigenous peoples movement, which is, um, yeah, yeah, United Nations. And even though there's, it, there's a lot of indigenous peoples in that movement, however, that circle is small. And um, I'd like to expand that circle I'd like to, no, sorry. I'd like to see that circle being expanded. Yeah. Um, but also uh, like to, yeah, people to know what's going on and being familiar with what's going on when it comes to um, indigenous peoples, indigenous people's rights, policy level. Um, I, th I think there's a lot of ind indigenous peoples out there that, that are, when it comes to policy level, domestic level, regional level, or international level, it's still a great area for them. Um, and through these through conversations like like these, just trying to give them a little bit of insight into into yeah, not only the uh, the work, but also the person um, uh, Lucky Sherpa to yeah how you, you maneuvered through all this um, in a way you know so that is um, I don't know like it, it is a long winded way of 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 of, of sharing like why 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 this um, why do this podcast. That's great. Yeah. That's great. 
And uh, I really want to congratulate your effort and uh, really want to support what you have been doing and, and really hats off to you for all of your initiation, your time, especially on the indigenous people's issues and movement and focusing on the people like us who can share our insights, our experience so that, you know, the other younger generation, even the small little girls can be inspired. I really value your, you know, like um, the way you have been, uh, you know, like contributing in this kind of, uh, I think, podcast is very, very necessary, especially on strengthening the indigenous people's movement, not only at national level, but also at the international level. And having said that, what I realized is, you know, like the way that you are doing work and I have been really, you know, like sometimes I, I might have pissed up you because, you know, like I was questioning you what you have been doing, what kind of, uh, you know, like activities that you are doing are involved. But after having said that, after getting to know about your work, about your, you know, like passion towards the indigenous people's issues, I felt it very, you know, like uh, interesting. And I, I really want to talk to you. I think uh, I should, uh, you know, like uh, give some time and moment for you to share my experience, the level of struggle that I have gone through. So, uh, yes, of course, I am an indigenous uh, Sherpa mountain woman uh, from the hilly regions, mountain regions of Nepal. And uh, Sherpa are one of the, you know, like uh, they are known for, very much known for the climbing Mount Everest, uh, you know, like uh, having some Guinness World Record holder and famous for making recognize the, you know, recogn giving recognition towards the mountain that we have in our country. So Sherpa are not known nationally, but they have been also known internationally. So Sherpa has become a kind of international trademark. So I'm proud that I'm Sherpa. And I'm also proud that I'm an indigenous woman from the mountain regions. So I always felt proud to represent my country not only as a Sherpa, but also as a Nepali. Mm. So uh, having said that, uh, it is of course not, a, not an easy journey that I have came through because, uh, you know, like if you, if you uh, re revide, you know, re re rewind my journey, then I was an activist before. I was a very seriously, you know, like issue focused, activist who used to raise the issues of indigenous peoples, minorities, even Dalit communities, and also the issues of gender discrimination. So I was very much, you know, like from by the heart, I was very much involved on the, those issues. And so I was raising those issues, not only at the international level, but also at the, not only at the national level, but also at the international level. So while I was raising those issues, I used to speak from my heart. I felt like, you know, I'm not raising these issues because I'm an indigenous woman, but because I really want to see the changes, you know, at the policy level, at the faces of my people who have been struggling so far. So I really want to, because I was quite fortunate enough to get a good, decent education education because my father was the professor and I was from a, from an educated family background. So I got a very good education. I did my master's in economics and I did, I was, I, I talked at my master's level education and I was awarded uh, uh, from my campus. So, you know, like uh, at the educational level, I was, almost, uh, you know, like uh, I did quite good. Mm. And um, so later on, what I felt is, you know, like being an indigenous, being a woman and being a girl child, what I felt is, you know, there is a huge discrimination. There's a huge, you know, like struggle, you know, uh, that a girl child had to face in Nepal. And I think that is the story of most of the South Asian region as well. So uh, as a girl child, you know, like you are never encouraged in my country, you know, though my parents were educated, they have accepted us, you know, 
but uh, accepted uh, accepted us and they didn't even cry for having another son or another you know like children but the thing is uh, our society our community you know they prefer male child you know boy child mm. so i was always questioned like why in my family my relatives my our neighbors they used to ask my parents which sometimes i remind myself and uh, what i felt is you know why you don't have any you know any any brother why you don't have any brother or you know like why you don't have any uh, yeah boy child and not having boy child doesn't gives a kind of you know like good fortune uh, fortune in our home so they used to have that kind of superstitious beliefs uh, a lot and so i always used to feel like that and especially my mother she used to motivate me like you know you are no more you know like uh, not they, so they raised me as a boy child you know mm. they gave me all the facilities all kind of you know like trainings all kind of guidance that uh, boy children used to get so i was fortunate enough to have that and uh, and uh, and besides that you know like my journey starts with the activism on the ngo sector especially on the girls trafficking issues on the human trafficking issues i raised those issues you know not only at the national level but also at the international level with having you know in, engaged with these victims you know i worked very closely with the victims of girls trafficking and human trafficking so i know the pain the survival of these you know girls and uh, i was very much involved with the united nation human the united nation human right uh, commission uh, you know that that lies in geneva where we had done some project on these the human trafficking issues which i was one of the main you know like programmer for that project so besides that uh, you know like how i get involved in politics is also very interesting i was a civil society leader very much actively engaged on these indigenous peoples uh, movement so by that time you know in uh, nepal there was a huge long 10 years you know like conflict a conflict where was going on so uh, that conflict had uh, ended ended after the after the recent after the after the you know like the first people's movement in uh, in around uh, like 2007 2006-7 there was a huge movement in nepal to you know like um and to abolish the monarchy system so i was very much heavily involved in that uh, you know in those uh, most of the civil society leaders were involved in uh, abolishing the monarchy and establish democracy and rule of law in the country so i was also one of the you know i was i was also part of that movement and uh, very actively part of that movement and so by the time uh, many especially the you know like insurgency was taking place and the insurgency period during the insurgency period also many indigenous peoples they get they were they died they lost their lives their families and most of them them who died from the state and from the uh, both parties were you know most of them were indigenous communities so mm. so you know like uh, that's why i felt uh, deeply tossed with the issues and concerns because why indigenous peoples they participate in all those you know like political um, uh, you know bloodshed movement where because it was because of the suppression and oppression from the state mechanized machineries mm. and uh, the state was not uh, you know like uh, state policies was very discriminatory in nepal for the last 240 years it has been remain a kind of hindu monarchy based uh, country which uh, has given uh, preference to only one language only one caste groups so there was a huge discrimination there was a discrimination in terms of uh, you know in terms of uh, 
the in terms of uh, the uh, the you know like the what kind of uh, you know like uh, uh, face you have what kind of you know like a religion you hold you know so there is a huge discrimination and discrimination is still prevailing in nepal mm. and um, uh, so uh, you can see especially even in the administrative section the discrimination is high like you won't be able to get to see that like uh, that kind of like equal participation of women and indigenous communities uh, in those administrative sector of my country but now the after the first constant assembly after abolishing the monarchy there was a first constant assembly and uh, after the uh, settlement of the peace process and there was a kind of agreement that there should be a kind of equal participation of indigenous communities in all the process of government. So, um, you know, and so uh, both uh, the conflict affected parties and the, and the government have uh, had done a kind of, there was a peace piece of accord, you know, piece of accord, which had clearly mentioned the inclusion and participation of the indigenous communities. So the first concern assembly, I was, uh, I was uh, very much, uh, you know, like uh, fortunate to have um, represented uh, one of the party of Nepal. They have taken me as one of the professional list candidates. So uh, you know, like being an indigenous woman, I got elected and I became the member of parliament as well as member of constant assembly uh, in the first constant assembly. So since I was, my background was not a kind of political cadre. My background was more on the indigenous uh, and the like women and human rights activist background. I always used to raise the issues in the parliament, in the constant assembly committees, as an activist, you know, not like as a party member. Mm. So I was not that much encouraged. You know, I always used to get a kind of, you know, like humiliating kind of, you know, like uh, behavior from the party members. They always used to have a kind of pressure on me and not to raise any issues of indigenous peoples, not to raise any issues of women. So there, were, there, there wasn't any kind of like enabling environment in the political party. So that was how I joined the party. But at the same time, the way I was raising the issues of all those, uh, you know, like excluded groups, who, which has to be dealt, because I felt that, you know, like while I was uh, actively engaged in the non-political movement, you know, most of the movement that we used to raise doesn't have, uh, always we used to, you know, like raise the movement at the street, at the conference, at the workshop, at the United Nation. But there was no any kind of, you know, like changes that we used to see. But after being part of the political process, what I realized is we had had a lot of, you know, like policy level changes. So just through that, you know, there was a participation, there was a very nice participation of, uh, you know, like indigenous uh, people's participation in the parliament. There was a policy level inclusion at the, you know, at, at, at most of the processes. Like uh, there was a, this ILO 169 have been endorsed is also because of the, our engagement uh, in the political party and our pressure in the political leadership. So, you know, like, so, so we have to be part of the political process, you know, that will definitely give a kind of added value to ensure our rights and concerns. Mm. Because as an activist and as a social activist, that will limit us only in the boundary of workshops, seminar, that's it. But if you want to reflect those things at the policy level, you have to be part of the politics. That is my experience. So Nepal has become one of the, you know, wonderful country of the world in terms of representation of the indigenous peoples you know, in the, in the parliamentary process. So our population in the in Nepal is 36.5% of the total population. The indigenous peoples hold a kind of majority in the population, but uh, because of the, you know, like uh, political uh, uh, principles and values and many things, you know, like they are not united. So the indigenous peoples themselves, they don't have any collective party. 
you know, there are different party, they represent different party. I represent one party, there are some other members who represent different party. And uh, that's why, you know, like the, the main, main agenda that uh, we used to carry while being a non-indigenous, you know, that used to, uh, used to be reflected at the international, at the, at the national level through the political process. Mm. So I really want to, you know, like encourage the indigenous um, communities and indigenous brothers and sisters uh, outside the world. What I want to say is, you know, you should be part of the political process. Right. And then only you will be able to, you know, reflect your issues at the policy level. But of course, you are never encouraged. You are never encouraged uh, to raise those issues. You are sometimes, you know, become a kind of victim of the political leadership because our mainstream media, our mainstream political parties, the most of them, you know, they are not supporting towards the the issues of the discriminated discriminated groups or marginalized groups. They are not that much supporting. They only holds the political agenda, votes, campaign, you know. So these are the things which we used to see in the political processes. And they don't like, you know, us to talk about the issues, talk about uh, the, you know, like um, issues of Mazda's communities, you know, like uh, which doesn't satisfy their political agenda. So, you know, as a being an indigenous woman, it's also very difficult. Mm. And uh, what I realized is because I was very much engaged in many non, non uh, many indigenous peoples, uh, you know, like uh, participation, also in the at the United Nations. And I was the first MP to lead the indigenous parliamentary forum. You know, I had a side event at the United Nations, bringing the indigenous parliamentarian from around the globe. Mm. So that was a very interesting side event at the United Nations, the UN Permanent Forum in Indigenous Issues, where I hold that event for the first time, you know, like the Sami parliamentarian and parliamentarian from New Zealand and Australia, they, they were part of, they participate in that process. And, uh, the thing is, you know, like the indigenous movement and indigenous people's issues had been very much highly recognized and are, are highly, you know, like uh, uh, raised at the international forum and international arena. Um, but, uh, you know, like at the national level, you know, like I think we have to, you know, monitor through what we did at the national level. What kind of changes have we been able to see at the national level? So for me, I was an indigenous ac activist. I was a human rights activist. I was an woman activist. I was very much active at the, you know, like uh, uh, during the movement. But at the policy level, now we have a very equal participation of the indigenous communities. So these are the changes that we have. But we have raised the voices of indigenous women, not only at the national level, but also at the local level. So that was the kind of, you know, like achievement that we did. Mm. And uh, the problem that I see is even at the international level, level also, you know, there was not a kind of like united movement of the indigenous peoples. I realized that, you know, there should be some kind of big heart, you know, they don't, you know, like uh, accommodate uh, those issues. They just remain to be a kind of, you know, non-political, but that doesn't make any sense, I believe. They have to accommodate, they have to bring together, they have to, you know, join hands with the political forces as well. So, you know, um, being an indigenous, being a parliamentarian, being in the, even right, even in the diplomatic sector, you know, it, it was definitely not easy. There are so many different forces which they used to hinder our, our you know, like uh, personality, they used to blame on different areas, they never used to encourage us, they used to blame through different media, they used different, uh, you know, like channels, because we used to have the opponent party, which used to take us as an enemy, they used to throw different kind of, you know, like uh, blames, blaming games, and especially if you are a woman, they target in a very different way. So by that time, 
where are our indigenous leaders who can safeguard those issues? You know? so these are the things that we miss mm. because we have been raising these issues from the very beginning, but there are there isn't any, you know, like indigenous uh, monitoring mechanisms at the international level where these indigenous leaders will be targeted. Mm. There was a time where, you know, the Kitauri Karpos was targeted, but what was the, like, what kind of like pressure that we have been able to do at the national and international level, you know? So these are very important. And uh, there are so many leaders where, uh, where we are targeted, even I was targeted, and there are so many leaders where we are targeted being an indigenous activist. Mm. So how we are going to collectively, you know, like collectively support uh, each others and, uh, you know, like, um, yeah, and raise, you know, have a kind of build a kind of collective alliance to uh, face those kind of challenges, I think. So right. uh, I just uh, hold a second because I sure. have, yeah, my dog is inside. <laughs> Yeah. What kind of dog do you have? I have pug. <laughs> oh, you have a pug. Oh, nice. <laughs> I have one small pug and one big um, German shepherd. Oh, and how old are they? <laughs> uh, the pug and the shepherd. Pug is uh, old. She um, came old. She's like you know, nine years, mm. nine ten years, and German shepherd is just six months. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Are you a, are you a dog uh, person? Do you consider yourself as a dog person? Not much, you know. My son, oh, mm. I'm not I'm not that much dog person. My son, they used to sleep with the dogs. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Did you have did, so? Did, did you have a, a pets in uh, when you were um, when you growing up as well, or just because of your son? Did you have pets? Oh, in? just because of my son. You right. Know. <laughs> they love that so you know mm. no thanks so much for 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 uh, uh yeah. that uh, the very elaborate explanation of because what what i want to what i understand now better now that that it all it's it sounds like that you um in Nepal that you were almost like double marginalized so first as a as a female as a, uh, growing up as a as a girl child and then also as a, as an indigenous person mm -hmm. and um, with a very idealistic state of mind as in as in that you uh, you, you want to see justice you have a, you have this, you lead this activist style in in everything everything that you do what you which is what what struck me as as well was that um you you saw that there was um when it comes to politics there was no enabling environment and what a lot of people what some people do is like all right there's no enabling environment they step out of it uh but you know, what i what i sense from from what what, what from what you're sharing is that um, instead of stepping out of it, you just went in and you try to, um, yes, create that enabling environment. Um, what was the, what was the biggest challenge that, that, that you, that you, or what were the challenges that you faced, um, in order to create this enabling environment for, for indigenous peoples within domestic politics or within the, within the party? 
you know, like uh, from the first concert assembly, I really raised the issues as a activist, uh, as an activist leader, not as a political leader, you know, mm -hmm. I was more like an, you know, I used to sound like an activist. So definitely political leaders, they don't want to hear anything if you sound like an activist, you know, they want to hear something which is favorable towards their political agenda. And if you talk and if you raise the issues beyond their political interest, then you will be targeted. Mm. So that's why, you know, they never want any, you know, like educated and, and educated women to come forward and leave them. They mm. never want that. And they feel very inferior, you know. Even the indigenous people's movement, uh, they are not that much welcoming towards women, you know. If women, women uh, are a little bit, you know, like smart enough, educated, and, you know, are bold enough to raise the issue, then the leaders feel so inferior, you know, so this inferior status has given them lots of fear, you know, mm. so this fear, you know, the fear factors hinder, hinders the participation of those bold women, you know. They always prefer to have those who can say, you know, do whatever they prefer to so far, you know, like, uh, for example, who never questioned them, mm. who, you know, like, uh, never had any kind of, like, you know, who never raised any issues, who is very much supportive towards the agenda, who doesn't have any questions at all towards the leadership. Then these are the favorable, you know, favorable um, things that the political leadership wants in the, you know, see as a kind of, you know, like requirements in party politics. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you, you know, like come up enough and build up your, you know, like expertise and your education level, then definitely sometimes there will be a time where they will kneel down towards you and will come forward to take you as a kind of, you know, like one of the, one of the force, you know, force in the political party. Yeah. Because for that you have to really build up your own capabilities. Mm. Without having built our own capabilities, we can't even, you know, we, we just can't even raise the issues of like, you know, participation and representation. Mm. But our representation must have some kind of, you know, like effects, some kind of uh, policy changes. So otherwise, you know, just uh, the representation in the in the name of representation uh, has not given that kind of good result, especially in Nepal. Also, mm. You know, just to give an example. And uh, so, you know, like the leaders, uh, political parties are definitely uh, not so much friendly towards the women of Nepal. And uh, it, is, uh, I, it is not only, uh, you know, like uh, I think uh, the case of Nepal, but I think entire regions of the world, there is a kind of, you know, like mindset that, you know, female has less capabilities, they cannot uh, lead, they have to look after the family, they have to look after the, you know, like uh, household calls, so how they are going to, you know, make difference at the society. So these kind of notions have given some kind of, you know, like, um, you know, like gender, not, not being a gender friendly mindset. Even mm. the women, they used to have this kind of mindset. So I'm not, not just taking the, you know, giving uh, the stress on men, but it is um, the, mindset of women as well you know they don't take uh, the participation of uh, female participation that much of you know in a in a kind of you know like uh, easy way they take it very you know like uh, in, in the, especially well even in the household you know like uh, your mother your sister-in-law or mother-in-law may not be that much of you know like supportive enough to you know, like encourage you to come forward and move ahead. Mm. So, you know, like this mindset is everywhere in every household. And also in the outside world, uh, there is another layers of uh, discrimination where women have to face. 
So there is a multiple layer of discrimination where women have to face and uh, have to, you know, like come forward. Right. So it's not that easy, definitely, to be at this position. And uh, so, you know, like uh, since uh, this COVID pandemic, uh, you know, uh, this had also really had a very bad impact in, uh, in the intelligence of the world. And especially these days, Nepal and India are at the high, you know, like high COVID uh, pandemic deaths are, you know, like increasing day by day. Mm -hmm. so mostly the indigenous communities, uh, they're facing lots of, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, difficulties is also because of the language, because of the poverty, and because of the, uh, you know, not having an access at the with the policy level. Right. So these are some of the major issues that we are having right now. Hmm. This what what we see around the world is that the COVID nineteen pandemic has um, exposed a lot of. Uh, um, human rights violations and not only ex exposed it but also exacerbated um, um, the discrimination inequality and, and um, human rights violations that are on ongoing um, around the world um, it is what is uh, yeah what is situation right now in, in Nepal if you can if you can talk about that at all uh, so in Nepal you know like the pandemic have had got a huge impact in our economy in our daily lives like you know right now we are in a total lockdown and uh, this lockdown have been will be eased from tomorrow i think you know mm. few shops will be open especially daily essential shops will be open until uh, 12 a.m and after that you know like there won't be any shops open and uh, so you know life is not that easy over here and uh, we're at a total lockdown and you won't be able to see any vehicles moving at the street. <laughs> and um, even we feel very much, you know, like we had a uh, lots of fear while we used to see our friends, even if some of our neighbors, if they came and approached to us, we feel a little bit of, you know, like uh, fear, in, you know, factors very much high among us. Hmm. And each and every individuals are affected, and um, I have also seen many of our relatives died, and um, so you know, like it's affecting each and every households in Nepal. So you know, like travel restriction is very high, and uh, many countries have already started, uh, you know, like uh, started travel ban. Uh, guidance in their website, like US, um, Australia, and mm -hmm. even UK, you know. So they had uh, already announced the travel restrictions to Nepal. So, you know, like we are you know, surviving this kind of situation is also because of the government, you know, the present government is tot had totally neglected uh, the issues and concerns of the people and they will just focus on how to be at you know how to not to lose the power and mm. how to, not to lose the government so they are just focusing on that and and there is no vaccine for the you know vaccine discrimination is very high only the few accessible people are getting the vaccines and rest of the people they have not yet been vaccinated mm -hmm. and uh, so our diplomacy had totally failed and uh, our diplomacy had failed in terms of uh, having vaccine from china even having vaccine from india so you know like um so we are having lots of support from the international arena but there isn't any kind of vaccine support right uh, U.S. had recently announced this vaccine support, but that is also not, you know, like um, not um, uh, like that does not accommodate all our populations because mm. they have just uh, given few portion of vaccines to our people. You know, so this is the scenario where you know, like, uh, and our uh, present uh, um, government had also, you know, like uh, remain. Uh, 
had uh, started, you know, like this COVID pandemic had uh, really, you know, um, got a very positive impact on those, you know, like uh, people who wants to remain in power. Right. You know, they don't follow any constitution. They don't follow any rules and law, you know. Uh, they hold all the power and they suppress the people who are against them. And uh, this is the things that is going on in Nepal. Mm. So um, the political suppression is very high and they don't listen to any uh, like international communities and international people, you know, like uh, which uh, are raising the issues of, uh, you know, like having, having a rule of law to be established in the country. Right. And so there is a huge tussle between the, uh, you know, like uh, some tussle in different power centers. Like there are, there is, because, you know, COVID pandemic should not be dealt by one party politics. Mm. It has to have a kind of collective hands together, no? From despite different ideologies, despite having different uh, groups of people, there should be some kind of, you know, like, uh, collective, uh, uh, you know, like uh, collective uh, campaign, which will support, uh, which will be, which will fight against this pandemic. But the government wants to go alone, and they don't want to, you know, like uh, take part and help of other parties. You know, they just remain abstained, and so you know, like uh, like this, we had already foreseen more than eight thousand deaths till now. Oh. All the people have already, you know, lost their lives. Mm. So every day we are seeing more than 60 people are, you know, dying every day uh, because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, more than 3,000, 4,000 rates are, you know, uh, rates of, uh, you know, like affected are, uh, you know, every day we are having. So this is the scenario right now. Right. Because, well, like I said, and I thank you so much for explaining that, um, that you can see that the, the current crisis pandemic, like it, it shows the, um, the shortcomings of, 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 go of governments, um, to say the least, obviously. Um, make, make me wonder, you've been in, 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 the, in, in, in uh, politics for so long, has have very finely honed um, uh, sense of Justice, rule of law is, is, is what I gather from, from, how, from how, how you're talking. Um, have you ever thought about, um, like, what is the utopian view of the Nepalese government? Like, it's like, what, how, what is the, how should it look like? Um, have you ever thought about that? Nepalese government, you mean? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the uh, Nepalese government, uh, if, if, for example, you were in um, serving the highest office or in control, like, and what, what change, yeah, what changes would like would you would you would you make? Have you ever thought about that? Yes, of course. Yeah. When I was in parliament. You know, I was in the state restructuring committee and mm -hmm. the international relations for human rights committee. So I worked there four years as a member of that committee. And what I have foreseen, you know, you know, like my proposition, you know, as a member of parliament, my proposition for the, in the first meeting of this structuring committee is we have to, you know, change our bureaucratic sectors, you know, because bureaucracy had remained the same, though we had foreseen lots of political changes, but the bureaucratic sectors was the same, you know, same uh, groups of people, which doesn't have an, you know, like a very old fashioned traditional mindset, doesn't have any competency, you know, and doesn't deliver, who never had to, you know, like uh, get a kind of fast mark and who never had to get a kind of endorsement from the people. So I raised these issues and uh, raised the issues and I had, uh, you know, like uh, um, put an agenda, like we should have a if you want, if you really want to have the restructuring of the state, then we have to change the bureaucratic sectors. So that mm. was my kind of proposition, which was highly, highly, you know, nobody supported that proposition. Nobody supported. None of the oh. enemies supported that. Proposition. But 
Today, you know, after so many political changes, why Nepal is not, you know, like moving ahead? You can see Singapore, you can see Thailand, you can see different other parts of the world, you know, they were just like us before, but now they are really, you know, at uh, the forefront of economic zones, and we are nowhere. So mm. it's because of our incapacitated bureaucratic sectors, which had failed to deliver, you know, failed to deliver, you know, deliver, and failed to give a difference, and also have failed to, you know, like um, satisfy the community's need. The people say because the bureaucratic sector is very much highly dominated by the few groups mm. which doesn't represent our our you know in Nepal. Right. So you know so that's why that was the first thing that I want to foresee that the bureaucratic sector needs to get trained, needs to be you know needs to be highly influential because there will be lots of political changes but our bureaucratic sector has not delivered well. That's why you know we are not forcing any kind of changes in most of the other, uh, you know, in, dif in different sectors. So you know, like we used to blame politics, politicians, mm. but no, that's not true. Of course, we have to take some part that you know, politics has to be blamed because you have not deleted the bureaucratic sector, you have not guided and trained the bureaucratic sector well. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, the bureaucratic sector is one of the sector which we have missed to, you know, transform in Nepal. So that was one of the biggest weakness that I have foreseen in my political journey. Right. The bureaucratic sector, nobody is focusing on the bureaucratic sector. Right. You know? Um, do you, um... Do you, do you want to wait a couple of minutes for for, for, for the doc to, to settle down? So, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I will just. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you um, there's so much knowledge and wisdom in there that you were, you were talking about. Yeah, I just want to make sure that um, yeah, that the people <laughs> are able to hear it. Uh, obviously. Yeah. Um. What if? Because you've. <coughs> What was the the um the most um no let, let, let's let's look at it for from positive side. There's a <laughs> is it the, the pug or the, or the uh, German Shepherd that that is uh oh. <laughs> <going> with you. <laughs> um yeah so so uh, but um I was wondering like what was um more. What was the most interesting part of it? Uh, part of it. What was it? Was it being um, at the Parliament of Nepal or being an, an ambassador? Like, what was? Um, um, yeah, like I want. I want to say like what's what's more fun, but like um, yeah, or maybe what what maybe maybe we should ask that question. Like, what was what was the 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 most fun for you? Well, you know, like being an ambassador also, it has its own uh, responsibilities. Mm. And uh, I was, uh, as an ambassador, you know, like uh, I was I was very much actively engaged with the communities and even being an ambassador nominated by the government of Nepal, mm. I was heavily engaged with the communities over there as well. So the most of the MPs and even the parliamentarians in Australia, they used to tell me like, you are not like a normal ambassador, you are the people's ambassador. So many MPs, they used to name me as a people's ambassador. So because I was so much actively engaged with my peoples, the communities over there, it was a lovely community they were. And uh, you know, like, so I used to give my full time, full, you know, like time wholeheartedly and on demonst and on you know serving the communities and the people and the country. Mm. Yeah, so being an ambassador, it is uh, not that easy. 
because it is far more easy to be a politician than an ambassador because ambassadors they have to limit you know limit the uh, the the their perception they have to limit their expression they have to limit their you know like uh, you shouldn't uh, say anything you know before before uh, what you know you can't say what you like you know mm. being an ambassador but uh, as a politician you can say you can act you, you can deliver and you can sometimes react as well you know mm. but uh, being a diplomat uh, there were some so many you know like uh, burden you know boundaries where you know like you are not able to speak freely where you have some kind of restrictions you have to be careful with so many you know like um, layers mm -hmm. so as an ambassador you know like uh, there are limitations as well because you have to work for the government and for the country mm. in their interest in in the country's interest but as a politicians you can you can you know you can lead and you can sometimes you know you can direct you know you can direct direct the people and the bureaucracy Mm -hmm. But then as an ambassador, you, you are you won't be able to direct yeah. the bureaucracy, you know. So that is the difference that I have found being an ambassador, and um, and also you know like uh, 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 both journey has its own kind of uh, you know like rule of law. But uh, what I felt is you know being a politician is far better mm. far better you know because you speak what you like you know because you don't have any kind of you know like uh, kind of uh, boundaries or kind of you know like pressure mm. so uh, it's, it's 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 amazing to remain free you know free speak freely react freely you know like deliver freely so that is, uh, you know, like the free kind of things is very, very not uh, not easy, you know, like mm. it's, it's very uh, expensive. And uh, well, you are an ambassador, you have to remain straight and you have to, you can't speak what you like to speak, you can't react. And, you know, these are the things which I really don't like being an ambassador mm. because you have so many limitations and so many boundaries where you won't be able to react. But as a politicians, you can react and you can you can immediately you know like uh, direct uh, the negative uh, reactions and you know the negative actions and even lots of many other things. So mm. uh, you know like ambassadors uh, has a limitation, right. but the politicians uh, as a politicians uh, you are open open. You know, you are, you work as an open in in, in an open environment. Right. You, know? you don't have right. any strict uh, rules and regulations, mm, and uh, you can talk freely with the people. You can get involved with the people. So uh, that is what I felt. Mm. Is is it now that now think of it? Um, is it it is kind of um, in terms of reception? It's kind of ironic that it was easier for you to be accepted as an ambassador being a female indigenous ambassador than a female indigenous politician. Um, so uh, it was easier to, to you received beyond the borders uh, than, to, than um, to be acknowledged as a female indigenous um, person um, domestically. I think that is kind of ironic mm -hmm. I, I believe um mm -hmm. yeah how how did they yeah, what wh how was the the um the because and, and i like that, that you, you've been called the people's ambassador i think that's a huge compliment um yeah for, i love that to yeah, be received I right like that, yeah um because uh you know like uh generally you know like speaking 
if my if my country people they have some kind of problems and they used to ring me even at the night you know mm. and i used to serve them you know i don't used to say that is friday saturday or you know like it's a vacation no more weekends at all i used to work 24 hours you know i used to uh, deliver a lot you know especially focusing on the community Mm. So um, uh, during my tenure, I never said that, you know, today office is closed, you won't be able to do that. Or, you know, like you are stopped in the airport, so you have to wait for another day because today is vacation. No, I never said that. The, you know, the time, the day I got any information about the people who are in a problem, I tried to, you know, like I tried to uh, give them the service that I could hmm. to the best of my capability. Right. So, so therefore, you know, like the, I was very much successful enough to have a kind of, uh, you know, land for my country. And, uh, you know, the government of Australia had given a huge, uh, you know, concession on having a land, diplomatic land in our area. So, so many, you know, like positive reflections that the Austrian government had made during my tenure. We have established the Nepal Australia Parliamentary Forum, where we have engaged the Australian parliamentarians as well as the Nepali parliamentarians as well. Mm. So, you know, like uh, there was a use, you know, a kind of, you know, like um, two way relationships among us, where, you know, both not only the country to country relationship. But I try to build the people-to-people -people relationship, you know, between the Australia and Nepal and New Zealand as well. So that was a really interesting and um, interesting experience for me. And um, yes, uh, but uh, still, you know, like uh, I felt like it's far better to be politician <laughs> than diplomats. It, 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 so it sounds like very much you are a very um a person that is very um keen on maintaining freedom um yeah. and, and free, as freedom is a very important freedom aspect freedom is not free and freedom is not free mm. and freedom is very expensive and people have died to you know die you know they sacrifice their life to achieve the freedom mm. so at that moment you know i felt like you know i i used to have a very wonderful apartment i used to have all the workers, guard, drivers, everything, you know, but still I prefer the politicians, you know, the journey of politics, you know. Hmm. That, is, that is why I'm here and I'm still engaged with the mainstream politics. I'm still engaged with the you know, mainstream politicians and political literacy. But having said that, what I realized is, you know, the, our politicians and the political literacy they had, they still lack lots of knowledge and expertise and, mm. you know, where we won't be able to compete at the, you know, like international markets. So in order to make our politicians, uh, you know, and especially focusing on the indigenous politicians and especially focusing on the youth, what I felt is, you know, like bring that knowledge back home, mm. you know where the young Australian youth politicians are delivering differently than that of the young politicians in Nepal. Mm. So how can we bridge that, you know, differences? How can we bridge that knowledge, you know? That is a uh, part of uh, work that I have been working right now. And, uh, you know, it's not only about the, and one of the things that I'm focusing right now is also on, you know, like supporting the indigenous youth politicians who are really, you know, giving their time, moment, and had a passion to work in politics. Mm. I look forward to create a kind of, you know, like network among them where, where I can share my knowledge and my experience so that, you know, I, can, I will get to see many indigenous youth leading our country in a right way and in a proper way. Right. So right now our politicians, many politicians, they do lag, they do very much, you know, they're very knowledgeable. But the problem is still they lack lots, you know, like knowledge is mm -hmm. which uh, they can get from the other part of the world. Right. So what? I try to 
create a kind of linkages through an institution where we will be supporting these youth politicians from different background, irrespective of sex, you know, and the rest. So right. uh, look forward to build and encourage these youth politicians in your future. You, um, because you, because of you, your amazing track record, you, you also uh, have been, um, yeah, serving a lot of uh, NGOs, uh, doing a lot of work for them. And so there, there's a very wide network that, that I can envision that, 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 that's, yeah, that you are, um, have access to. Um, you just, you just now said, said, said something about like, Australian youth knowledge and, and, uh, and you see a lot of good examples that you would like to also like to see with Nepalese indigenous youth knowledge. Um, is there anything, any, anything that, um, that you saw in Australia, like that made you like, oh, wow, that I would love to see that um, amongst the, the Nepalese indigenous youth. Of course, you know, there's so many good examples that mm. we can take from Australia. And especially the politicians, you know, the politicians, the youth politicians that I have gone through in Australia, they're amazing. And they are very much encouraged, you know, if you have passion and if you want to come forward, you know, uh, the Austin politics, you know, there are some gender differences and gender based issues in Austin politics as well. Mm. But, you know, like the youth politicians, the youth MP that I have uh, met in Australia, they were amazing, you know, they work so differently, you know, which we really lack. Mm. And uh, at this 21st century, you know, we are still, you know, like uh, going through the same kind of, you know, like traditional mindset, a kind of, you know, like a kind of, you know, like a very, you know, like limited narrow concept that we have. And if we are guided by that kind of narrow concept, then we won't be able to achieve anything. Mm. So we have to change our political uh, leadership had to be transformed because, you know, they can take back from like Australia. In Australia, the, especially, you know, the parliamentarians, they, you know, like they go to the people every week. Can you imagine? Every mm. week they used to, you know, like um, uh, share the brochure, you know, share the brochure by saying that, you know, what they did in the policy level. What kind of changes they have made in the pol at the policy? It's not like how many, you know, like house they have built, how many roads they have constructed. No. What policies, what policy impact mm. you know, they have they had gone through in their right. in their you know like activities. So they used to, you know, had a brief report. And they used to, you know, like uh, send it through email every week. Even I'm getting some of these MPs messages right now in, uh, you know, Nepal as well, you know, like they used to send all these kind of, you know, information, what they have been doing, especially change, change the policy. Mm. And they live so simply, you know, especially in the developing world. If you get to meet with the politicians, they had so much of huge hierarchy, you know, mm. the hierarchy of mindset is very high and you'll get to see all the guards and, you know, big offices, all the quarters, nothing you can get to see in Australia. Mm. You know, even the ministers, they used to come by, you know, like jogging around and having one cup of, you know, cup of coffee holding and in one newspaper and, you know, going in a very simple way. Even the minister, they don't have that kind of huge quarters, a residential, you know, like a th uh, kind of um, services they have mm. they used to come and they just get the allowance for the work they used to do and deliver. But, you know, like these are the things that we have to learn because especially like, uh, you know, in a developing country, the ministers they used to have a big quarters not only for themselves but for the for their family for the wife for the children you know mm -hmm. so, but for the people no right you know for the people they never focus on people they mm. focus on themselves you know so right. that is the difference 
And while I used to visit the foreign ministers and while I used to visit the other ministers, what I felt is, you know, they used to talk about the policies, they used to talk about the issues. But if you get to, to uh, you know, meet with the, your home country ministers, they used to talk about their own personal issues. Mm. They used to talk about their own personal interests. So right. that is the difference I felt. So, you know, if you want to build your country, the main thing is, you know, to, no matter which position you are, you have to be accountable and responsible towards the people. Right. How does, because um, you, you're involved in a lot of, um, in, in, in a sense of networks and also NGOs, uh, how can NGOs contribute to this? Um, what, what, what do you like to promote? The NGO sectors, uh, you know, like have definitely contributed a lot and mm -hmm. having policies friendly towards the indigenous peoples, like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, ILO 169. So these are the instruments, you know, like through which we can lobby for our rights and concerns, you know. Mm only at the national level but also at the international level you know right nepal had ratified both of these institutions they have endorsed al 169 as well as the un declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples so so how the nepal had ratified the both institutions it might be surprised because it's because of the political achievement we had so far you know mm. it's because of the political achievement Nepal is very good on ratification and endorsement, but very poor at the implementation. Mm. Follow up of those laws and policies that we used to endorse. So that was the case. And uh, at the international arena, I, I think there should be some kind of openness towards those political leaderships who are making difference at the policy level, focusing on the indigenous peoples and other marginalized sections, you know. Mm. So the international organizations and institutions we are working at the uh, at the national and international level they have to come closer with these political minds you know with these groups who have delivered a high at the high level you know not only at the national level but also at the international level they have to open up the boundaries right and they have to open up the boundaries they shouldn't be limited on their own you know, like family kind of uh, things, because NGO sectors has to be wide enough, you know, mm -hmm. and there should be more open space for the individuals like you, the, for, for, the, for any individuals, you know, from mm -hmm. different around the world, you know, they can uh, come up together to work, but you will get to see the same faces, same people every year, you know, most of these international meetings, that has to be changed. Mm. There should be new voices. There should be new forces coming up every day, every time. You know, there will be more, 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 and more youth get involved. You know, there shouldn't be a kind of syndicate of only one few people. You know, and just few. You know, faces at the international forum and international arena. That should be wide enough. I 100% agree with with, with uh, what you just what you said just now because I I do get the feeling um, that um, unconsciously or unintended um, a an elite is being created like and there's the only the there's only a few people peoples um, that yeah they, they 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 keep on coming back coming back is okay but they 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 take in the, these key roles and key positions. And yeah. mostly it is has something to do with project funding. Um, and they sit on, on top of that as, as a watchdog, as, as a guard dog. Yeah. Mm. And that's what that's, it, it, I think that is detrimental to um, indigenous peoples at large. Mm -hmm. uh, because what you want is that you, we elevate the level of expertise and that we expand the movement. And, and I think the strength the, the, yeah, the diversity in, in, the, in the movement is a strength. However, um, like we talked about, COVID-19 is also exposing, uh, is, it also exposes the, the, the weaknesses of the, of the movement right now. It is, it is what I sense in, in, in 
in yeah in 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 the movement is that it's we're, we're spread thin um that it is there's youth some some there, there's coming youth coming up however somehow they're not being interested enough to keep on coming back um that it, it is not being made interested enough to for them to um yeah to keep keep engaging and and um yeah, well, you, you of all people obviously know that it is for, for in policy changes, it is slow. It, 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 is, it, is, it is very slow. And there's this, uh, maybe it is the millennials, I don't know, but there's this idea of instant gratification that like, I, I'm going to the UN today. I want to see UN peacekeepers on my doorstep in Kathmandu tomorrow. And so so that, that is, that is uh, um, to put it very bluntly, uh, obviously, um, that 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 is um, what people, um, some use you you see, but the biggest the um, what you touched upon, I think, is something that uh, which which is core of it, which is something that I think there's a lot of we're experiencing in all countries, and maybe you have a better idea of it. Um, is the disconnect between international achievements, commitments. And the implementation on the national level, there's a huge disconnect. Um, yeah, any thoughts on that and how it can be addressed, or any observations within? You always shared about Nepalese context, but maybe you have some observations of that as well. Yeah, um, I think you know uh, these. Uh, the I think international indigenous peoples movement had to have a kind of preview session, you know, review session on what we have achieved so far and mm. what we have still, you know, remain to be achieved mm. and where our weaknesses, what, which were the weaknesses we have and what are the you know, strengths we have. I think we have to really review our movement. No? Mm. Like in Blender also, we have a kind of review process of Beijing plus 10 review and then Beijing plus 20. So these processes, we don't have in indigenous people. We don't have any review section. Huh? No. So I think we do have the permanent forum on indigenous issues, which is one of the wonderful platforms where our indigenous communities come forward and you know they can raise the issues and the concerns you know which they felt at the international forum. Mm. But uh, we still don't have that review mechanisms. I think you know, like where our movement is heading and what kind of challenges that we have been foreseeing. For example, we are foreseeing the challenges at the climate change sectors, at the, at the you know, like political participation, at the, you know, like uh, endorsing the, at the, at, the, at the different, you know, like uh, resource uh, benefit sharing mechanisms. So, at this point, you know, like um, we have to, we must have a kind of, you know, like collective review uh, process mm. among the indigenous uh, activists, leaders, and uh, NGO sectors, where they can come up together and they can, you know, like share their own, you know, experiences. They can share their own knowledge. They can share their stories. They can share their stories of success that. You know the way you have been you know going through so so these are the things that they can share but right now it has all stopped and you know like we don't know where we are you know have had we reached the top or are we at the middle of the sections what kind of rights that we have achieved so far how many countries are still you know behind you know achieving the rights towards the indigenous peoples how can we be able to support them so mm. this kind of analysis uh, part of things is missing yeah. So I think we have to create that kind of, you know, review uh, process where we can, uh, we can, you know, articulate our issues and uh, knowledge that we have and we can even share among us so that that could be a kind of, you know, like backup support for, for our movements. Yeah. F funny, funny, you talked about, well, not funny, uh, but uh, you touched upon climate change. Um, under climate change, what what is what we're seeing right now is for for um, there are some processes that are have a have an existential threat to indigenous peoples when it comes to um, 
carbon market mechanisms, um, which is currently called Article 6 under the Paris Agreement. Um, what, what I see is that um, for in, in diplomacy, you need to have uh, um, support from countries all around the world. Um, you, you need to be. You need to show that the, the co-facilitator or people that are actually negotiating the text need to see that there's support from all, countries all around the world. And I think one of the things that we are coming to realize right now is that um, indigenous peoples have only one corner of the world that are um, almost um, unconditionally supporting indigenous peoples' rights. Um, um, uh, which is um, currently hasn't been uh, consistent before, but currently, for example, it is uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, um, some of the the, uh, the Latin American countries. However, um, and you talked about rule of law. However, to the respect of the the rights of indigenous peoples and human rights in in climate change. Um, to have that inclu included in any policy uh, resolution, um, you do require support from countries in Africa and Asia and, and, and as well. Um, obviously, there, there's some big players uh, in there, however, but you do need to be able to show that there's, um, that there's global spread, so to say. And what I, what I, see, what I see is that, that we're still lacking on, on that level, because uh, you, you talked about like, there's a measurement, right? Like, how far are we? Um, are we in terms of our plan of action? Are we in the beginning? Are we, the, are we in the middle? Are we at the end? What is it? Um, that is that is a question that, that that we definitely need to need to address. And which which I thought of, which I went, went through my mind um, uh, like the last couple of weeks actually, but also like why are we quote unquote losing we're continuously losing uh, on big issues um, or not being able to create traction on big issues like climate change and if you like down the line like if you put it like if, if you add, add and subtract everything on on the, down the line i see that that as a movement we're still not able to create a global spread or global support for Unconditional, not unconditional, but like the classic supporters of indigenous peoples um, within within Asia or within Africa, which which is which are very important groups under under climate change. There, there's the the least developed countries. There's the G seventy seven plus China, and then these. So you you need to have yeah uh, some presence in, in in these groups, particularly from the uh, from the from the what is called the global south. Um, yeah, just just a reflection. Obviously, you don't have to comment on it if you, if you don't want to. But it is something that I uh, want you. We we talked about it, and you made a very good point. The review process, the being very, being able to measure where we are, uh, where we're going, and how much support we have. I think that is still. Um, it has the way that we have been able to man to move forward today until today has worked. Um, but you do see as the world becomes more complex and is more intertwined that measurability of progress is now also, uh, is becoming a factor, um, being able to, 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 to measure it. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's just, just, just a reflection. Um, That's true. Yeah. In climate change, you know, like uh, there is, uh, kind of, you know, like we are raising the issues uh, at the country level, at the regional level, but we are not, you know, like collectively, we still, you know, we still have to work a lot. And, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, while, you know, there are many countries where, you know, the indigenous peoples are at the, you know, forefront and they're one of the most affected by the climate change. And their issues have not still been supported by the other regions of the world. So there should be some kind of linkages and there should be some kind of, uh, you know, like processes to, yes, there are a few, uh, you know, like um, indigenous organizations which are raising these issues mm -hmm. at the national level as well as the international level. 
uh, but still, you know, they have to involve and they have to, the, the sharing of the information are still very much minimum. And uh, I think now the CBD, you know, especially Convention on Biological Diversity, and the, um, I think there is a different uh, special, uh, you know, like uh, subjects on the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues as well. So these are the, in these areas, you can, uh, you know, you can raise the issues where, you know, many indigenous peoples, they're getting part of these processes. Mm -hmm. And uh, even in Ayushan also, there are some section on indigenous and local communities. Uh, which uh, through which also you know like uh, we can raise our concerns and uh, come up collectively. So I think uh, you can uh, go through those uh, areas where you know there were some international uh, networks that has already been formed. I think and uh, where you can you know uh, you know ask for the information and uh, you know ask for the documents that you can. I think they can um, forward you those uh, information so far. Yeah. Um, what is, I'm listening to you, a, a very impressive track record uh, where perseverance and sense of justice and rule of law is, is, is one of the pillars, what I, um, what I sense, um, the, the activist life still having that mindset um what is the dream what 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 is it that you'd like to see um maybe at the end of, end of the road or like what is it that, that you'd like to it can be for indigenous peoples nepal itself do you have a dream actually that that you would like to to contribute to or to see become a reality well you know like uh i do have dreams I do have dreams where, you know, like uh, none of us will face a kind of discriminations where my children shouldn't face the discrimination that I have gone through, where, you know, my community should not face, where my people, you know, especially, you know, like uh, the those who are very much highly discriminated and marginalized, you know, groups, they should not be you know, like uh, there should be equal justice for them. So, you know, that is a kind of dream, dream of equality, dream of equity and dream of having a very just society. You know, mm. that is the big dream that we have where you don't feel discriminated just because you are a woman and just because you are indigenous, where, you know, you feel, you, sh you just feel like you are the first citizen of the country where, you know, you shouldn't be portrayed as because of your, you know, like um, uh, caste and um, groups, because of your groups and because of the, um, the way that you look, the, you know, there the, the shouldn't be any kind of discriminatory, you know, like um, 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 discriminatory, you know, like, um, uh, portrays this is like you know right now you know the asian hate things mm. asian hate things are getting very high uh in uh, america in australia you know the issue of uh, these uh, racial discriminations are also getting very high even the regional issues are also very getting high so we are become a kind of global world, you know global in this globalized world we are like one family Mm. And we shouldn't be discriminated on the basis of our race, sex, or a, you know, like what from which country you are. So it's not like you know. So, so therefore, you know, like my dream could be to see the equal world where none of the people will be discriminated on the basis of anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is what kind of big dreams, right. you know. And uh, I think that takes time. It takes time to fulfill that dream, but we have to keep on working and keep on moving on that. And uh, my whole journey will be, you know, will be focusing on to that dream. And uh, so far we have achieved some at the national level and we are still have to work a lot at the international level. 
and I'm always open to all the individuals who are supportive towards achieving that goal mm -hmm. of having that just and equal society. And uh, yes, yes, I am always looking forward to work with all the individuals from different parts of the world mm. and I'm creating, creating that enabling environment where we can find that uh, you know, society of equality and justice. What is, what is the um, personality, personality trait or skill you think that is most important to, uh, to on that journey to, to get to that dream? Uh, like, uh, you know, uh, the uh, skills and the main thing is, you know, you should have some passion, you know, passion, mm. you have to be passionate on uh, working for the society and working for the community. And uh, that is one of the uh, kind of, you know, like, because we, if you talk about the development and growth, and if you forget the community and the people, then that kind of um, development and that kind of growth will not bring any kind of, you know, like sustainability. Mm -hmm. So in this 21st century, we're talking about the sustainability, you know, the sustainable development. And sustainable development can be achieved only by bringing that kind of, you know, like harmony among the communities. So, you know, taking side by the community issues, giving them all kind of like, you know, you know, getting them involved in all those discriminatory provisions, processes, will not give any justice and will not foster the growth, you know. We talk about the economic growth, but having, you know, like, uh, you know, not being acknowledging the human resource we have, the communities we have, we won't be able to achieve those kind of, you know, like achievements. So mm -hmm. focusing and investing on our communities, you know, giving them all kind of trainings and, you know, like that will definitely bring sustainable growth. And right. which are, we, we are missing in many parts of the world, even my country, you know, they leaders they used to talk about the big buildings big growth and you know big trade trade buildings they have a big economy no you know because big buildings doesn't give happiness mm. you know happiness comes from that sustainability uh, uh, sustainable growth and sustainable growth can become only from the from the from the from if your communities are happy if your communities are happy with what they have. Mm. So I think focusing more on the sustainable growth is the only way where we can achieve our, you know, so-called just and equal society, I think. Yeah. This is such a, um, I'm so glad that I had the, because I was super nervous actually to, to, to actually reach out to you and ask if you uh, had time to, um, to, um, uh, to, um for doing this um but i'm so glad that i actually had to the guts to do it and because been so inspirational um and also there's a lot of knowledge and wisdom uh, that you shared just now and so i very much would like to thank you for that um because i can i can i can imagine that um yeah it, it, there's there's as a, as a politician that you yeah there, there are some limitations however yeah, you, you do talk about freedom, and I, I can sense it through everything that you say, um, that, that, that there's a fine um, sense of, 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 of yeah, well-articulated sense, sophisticated sense of, of freedom um, uh, that you have. Conversation I'm that we've had. you know, I'm, I'm definitely in the process of writing a book, and, uh, you know, but if we, if I, you know, like, uh, come up with all the facts now, my mm. political process journey will be stopped over here. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. So you, you're still you're still in politics. You're still um, yes, yes. okay, yeah. So that is yeah. Well, yeah. So you know, like uh, I really don't want to, you know, like um, because in a book, in your biography, you know, you have to, you know, write the facts and figures, and you have to, you know, like. Sometimes even, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, portray the names of those individuals who have given you the hard times and the bad sure. memories, bad times, everything. You mm -hmm. have to go through the book. So uh, if you do that, then 
you know, the political, it's politically, you know, that will definitely had a kind of, you know, like impact on me. But for the, you know, like for the, uh, for the upcoming generation, that could also be a kind of, you know, like knowledge to articulate and, uh, you know, like get aware of like, you know, what kind of political journey that an indigenous woman in Nepal had to face. Right, yeah. And what kind of, you know, like challenges they have to face, not only at uh, the, at home and at the society, but also at the national and also at the international arena. So, you know, yeah. uh, the huge um, areas where, you know, my books will be around. But mm. I can write something more on my journey of activism. I know activism journey, especially on the rights and recognition of the indigenous communities in Nepal. Uh, yeah, and uh, well, obviously a book of what you talk about earlier, that's what usually people write after their, their political career and you're, you're still in the middle of it. So I 100% I agree that <laughs> you. <laughs> you, you, you don't want to do that. Um, in the and, and definitely looking forward to to anything that you uh, like to share. And also, by all means, if you'd like to share more, um, my my the door of my podcast is will always be open for you. Oh, sure. um, so see that as a, as an as a uh, option on the menu, obviously, because oh, you don't have to yeah. um, you don't have to do that. Um, in the interim of a book, is there any um, any way that people can um, reach out to you or ask you questions um, on, on, on the internet, social media, website. Is there anything that you can share um, for that? About the book? No, so, no, no. Um, so in the interim of a book, right? So, so there's no book yet, uh, but people listening and watching, they're like, oh my God, oh my God, this lady is super inspirational. Um, <laughs> let, let me at least be friends with her on, on, on some platform okay. uh, or let me ask her a question. Is there I'm any, open, you know, I'm open to any questions and I'm open to any kind of uh, information that uh, my, uh, you know, like the many friends from international arena or uh, the national arena, if they have any questions, they, uh, they are always free to write me. They can, you know, free to uh, inform me or they can send any messages if they like, you know, I, there is no any kind of restrictions on that. Yeah. Appreciate, appreciate it. Um, um, you're, you're super, um, um, not only during, during your, your life as, as a diplomat in, in, in Australia, uh, but also right now you're super um, approachable and which is very much appreciated. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for your time. Um, really appreciate it's it. Gazeli, Gazeli, Gazeli. Oh, go, go. Yeah. Huh? Gazali. Yeah. Gazali. Yeah. Gazali. Thank you, Gazali. And uh, it's really a pleasure talking to you. You know, like, uh, I just feel like, you know, I'm talking to my brother and sharing all the experiences and, you know, and uh, you have been doing a wonderful work. And this will be a gives you a kind of insight on, you know, like talking with different individuals and different personalities and, uh, you know, like raising the concerns of indigenous peoples. I think that is one of the most important tasks that you have been doing. I really want to thank you. And I really want to be in touch also. So it's definitely a journey where we can come together on different uh, approaches where we can empower each other. 100%. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to that uh, when we can do in meeting sure, things as well, sure. uh, in person meetings as well. Sure, um, sure. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, enjoy your night, uh, evening, night, and, and dinner, perhaps. Yeah. And say, give my best to your family and your dogs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gazali. Thank you. Right. Same to you. Same appreciate to you. It. Thank you so much.